downloading to those who have no God. I can't, I can't sing it by myself hardly. Sweet morning, sweet morning, and we'll all shout together in that morning. The old man was one of the first Oklahomans, but we have never seen the looking glass of his mind. His history has always been there, but we have never looked through the looking glass darkly. I saw Oklahoma the beautiful this place I ever saw in the spring. Oh, look, a young girl has some Indians. And all the cowboys were colored. That's Reed. I can tell you more about him than perhaps you ever heard. He wasn't too good with a rope. I'm one of the men that made General Lee surrender. They did everything to make you feel that you were something else than a human. We had to live. That's right. That's right. We had to put up with it. When uh, Andrew Jackson had all the Indian on that trail of tears, uh, whether whether the history books show it or not, a great percentage of those people were black people. I can remember when the before they, before they ever go, the Indians up on across the Mississippi River. That was an all, them Indians had an awful time. I got my mother and them talking about, I was, oh, a boy about seven, eight years old. They would, they beat them, they shot them, they kill them, they, they just murdered them oh, all kinds of ways. And run them on back across the Mississippi River, back over in Oklahoma. And this wasn't fitting for nothing else, and they just decided just to let them have, they give them this, and never bother them about it anymore. The treaty was, as long as oak and ash grow, and as long as water run down the stream, that they would never be bothered about this country. Hide the night, oh Lord, hide the night. No one knows for sure how many blacks came on the Trail of Tears. Census takers in those days didn't bother to knock on doors, and runaway slaves weren't answering any roll calls. Oh, lot of the colored, you see, you really know. And the Indians further them in and uh, that they would help them out. So all of them down that Mississippi River was just a dark swamp. And they, they could never get them out of there. They stayed in there. They would go back, skip at night, and go back on old monsters and them farm and kill hogs and cut it all up. And all the way back, they start a song. Said, way back, way back. I'm going to make it to my shanty, way back. How dogs on my truck and the chickens on my back, but I'm gonna make it to my shanty way back. He would get cutting time and put it all under the bottom of the feet to keep the dogs from tracking them. The paddle rollers would uh, come out with the hounds and go out and run them in the woods and run them and uh, probably catch a whole lot of them. Every time they caught a slave, they got $700 for that slave. You know, that's the way they personally made their living. Oh, I'd rather be fishing for Brimmy and the Creek and working in the sun. Oh, yeah, all we for specs to get here, Lord. Specs to get here. I got to keep on. Not all of the slaves were runaways. Some of the tribes in the South had plantations of their own. A black back was the going thing in a cotton field, no matter what color the owner happened to be. No. But ironically, it was this association that set the lifestyle in Indian territory for more than a hundred years. I got to do it, do it now. I got to do it, do it now. I got to do what I'm doing. All of them people from northern Georgia, Tennessee, and all that, that when they were moved out, they carried their slaves with them. And their slaves were the one that taught them agriculture, house building, and uh, uh, how to make a living other than fishing or hunting, because that was the Indian's tradition, just fishing and hunting. 
But now that was the and that was the salvation of Oklahoma, and that's the reason why it got to be known as five civilized tribes. These people live like civilized people. Some of those blacks, of course, married into the Indian family. That's why there was there's so many black Indian, Creek and Seminole Indians. And many of the Indians that were that ranked way high were black people. Most people don't know that Osceolio, the, 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 the chief of the Seminoles down there, was a half Negro. His mother was a Negro woman, but his father was a chief. Look at Jim Simmons over there if you want to. There, he, he's about two-thirds Indian, but on the rolls, he's a freedman. All right. Look at Reverend Davis here. Yeah, he's, he's about uh, a quarter breed, but on the rolls, he's a black man. Look at me. I'm a quarter breed, Cherokee, but... Uh, the rules say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Negro. If you commit murder, you're just subject to be tried for murder and convicted for murder and be shot. At sunrise, that's what my old stepdaddy would say. You had your trial, I've heard him say that. You've had the jurors, you have an attorney, you've had your witnesses. The jurors have found you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I set your execution at sunrise next Thursday morning. That settles it. The laws were written by the Indian and Negro legislation. You see, to commit a crime was something awful. And whoever did it, he wouldn't like it because it'd be remembered forever. And they would announce it all around. He's going to whip a certain man on a certain day for a committing an offense. And the people would come from far and near. There was no certain whip to be beaten with. The officer would go to the nearest wood and cut down a limb, trim it up nicely, bring in a, two or three of them. There was a whipping that day. And if he's caught again, there was a hundred lashes on the same back by two officers. That's right. One fifty lash, the other one fifty lash. One man that counted that they wouldn't be missed or given to many. <laughs> Well, now, the third offense, if you caught again, that's right. And the third offense was death. That person would suffer death. There's no bond, no reprieve, no renewal, vacation, nothing of the kind. <laughs> they had no chamber of death. They didn't hang by rope. They had a block they set up. They would set the prisoner on there tie a white cloth across his chest about where his heart was. Two officers would take a rifle and step off according to the presiding off 30 feet, 30 yards or something like that, and then turn at his command. I've seen that right at the old Lee Court. As always in the aftermath of war, thousands were set adrift by peace. This time, many were black. For most, the only home had been army issue. Now that it was gone, there was no other. So they headed west. A savage tide was brewing in Oklahoma, and it would fall to the black man to cool the kettle. During the war, troops had been removed from the western edge of Indian territory. And now, Plains Indians were raiding the herds of the Chickasaws and the Choctaws. Bootleggers and horse thieves were entering illegally. And approaching white settlement was melting Oklahoma into a war path. Some of the black men were asked to keep their uniforms. Congress was forming six black regiments. Two were to be stationed in Oklahoma. 
General George Armstrong Custer was asked to command one of those regiments, but he refused, and in so doing, set his path to the Little Bighorn ten years later. Officially, those who came to Oklahoma were known as the 9th and 10th Cavalry, but to those who knew them best, the Cheyenne, Comanche, and Kiowa, they will always be remembered as the Buffalo Soldier. To the Indians, the black man's nappy hair resembled buffalo hide, and the name, a mixture of fear and respect, stuck. For 20 tempestuous years, the Buffalo Soldiers protected Indians from Indians and whites from renegades, and themselves from both. They were the law in western Oklahoma. Much of that time, they had the unpopular task of keeping boomers out of Indian territory. One man, William Couch, was escorted back to Kansas three times during the winter of 83. In the spring of 84, he was trying again. A long line of wagons moved south along the Canadian. More than a thousand settlers. This time, they meant to stay. Not far from the present-day Oklahoma City, they made camp and waited. Captain Carroll arrived with 90 tough-as-nails veterans of F and I troops and immediately got down to business. Couch was bound and tossed into a wagon. His followers could either move out under their own power or they could be helped out. Suddenly, the command came down to fire, but the rhythmic cadence spun slowly. Some say more slowly than usual, as the sergeant watched the captain and the captain watched the crowd. Only a heart's thunder sounded in the land. No one fired out of turn. The hasty order was countermanded seconds later. The settlers left. And Couch? Couch would finally get a street named after him in a city of his dreams. Even with all this, the Buffalo soldiers made for themselves a reputation second to none. They fought in every major Indian war in the Southwest. They quieted the Oklahoma frontier. And in the process, won 12 Congressional Medals of Honor. Their lasting memorial is Fort Sill, which they built and still stands. of the white men off fighting a civil war. What little cattle raising that was done was handled by women, children, and slaves. Given responsibilities that were denied in normal times, the black men soon numbered among the most skillful cowhands on the Chisholm Trail. Speaking about Mr. Pickett, Bill Pickett, I knew him, uh, not intimately, but I knew him real well. However, he was grown, and I was a child. It just so happened that uh, as kids will do, I kind of called myself a little sweet on his granddaughter. And this enabled me to go up and be around him quite a while. Mr. Pickett had some livestock on a little acreage he was working, and Occasionally they'd get out and that would kind of irritate him and he'd have to hunt for them at night and the neighbors would squawk. So one day one of his cows got out and his wife called him and told him that the cow was gone, he had to go hunt for him. Knowing Mr. Pickett, he, he wasn't too good with a rope. Now he could ride real well, better than 
average. But his roping left something to be desired. <laughs> so he chased this car and he couldn't get the rope on him, so seemingly through a little fit of anger, he's just going to manhandle this car. And he rode along beside him, and he got off on him. He leaned over between his horns and bit this car in the nose. This threw the car off balance and he stumbled. Car stumbled, he's trying to hold on. He just held on with his teeth and fell on over his head. And when he hit the ground, this sudden jerk threw the car. And to his amazement, he wanted to know if it was just a freak thing or whether it was something out of the ordinary, and he tried it again, and it worked again. So according to him and his daughter, Miss Nanny, that's how bulldogging was really originated. Few of the white men and none of the blacks who rode the cattle trails kept accurate journals. As a rule, they wrote history with their horses and punctuated it with six guns. And yet, to passing references of Black Sam, or simply a colored man named Charlie, it is clear that no fewer than 3,000 black cowboys passed through Oklahoma on the cattle drives to Kansas. Some of the first ranches in Oklahoma had all black cowboys. Jake Simmons was a man believed in producing making things come to pass. He was that kind of man. And he was an unusual farmer. He was a great farmer and a rancher, and was one of the leading ones around there. And about the first man that I know of, of the black people that accumulated, most of the others had a lot of land at the time, but was allotted to them. He is the first in, uh, uh, in that part of the country to buy those uh, registered Hereford cattle. He was a, a go-getter. Uh, how much did he accumulate? What's that, what's that? Well, about a thousand acres. Yeah. Thousand acres, and, uh -huh. and they're still in the family, isn't it? Yeah, it's still in the family. And then he was helpful to other people. He raised uh, many children aside from his own. There was always somebody in Jake Simmons' home, a young man or a young woman without a home. He lived that way until he died. Bud and Ed Cox were well-known Creek citizens, freedmen's. And they operated a big ranch out there, five miles west of Wetumpka. And uh, every summer they would have uh, a branding festival. They'd get out and round up the cattle. And those black cowboys would uh, go out and bring those cattle in. They had, oh, they have maybe a thousand or fifteen head of them at a time. Well, Indians and colored freedmen owned all the land, and the whites they hadn't, didn't have a chance to get in here. So all the ranching business was done by colored, and all the cowboys were colored. There weren't any whites until after statehood, when the country was opened up. That's Reed. I can tell you more about him than perhaps you ever heard. The officers of the law the chief one among us in the Indian Territory were known as United States Marshals. They came in from the states and they were paid by the United States government. And Baz Reed came from Arkansas as one of those United States Marshals. Baz was a kind, sympathetic man, but he was a brave man man and then mentally and physically strong he could whip most any two men with his fist <laughs> he was a man that when he went after a group now brother he'd bring you in that's all but he was very kind and sympathetic he never pulled in and caused trouble i've seen him come in the community and come to the church on sunday and he'd have a warrant for somebody to call him out and sit there I've got a warrant for you, sir, but would you mind coming into Muskogee get the marshal office tomorrow morning? He told you that nicely. He said, hey, I don't know what it is. You better go see about it. If I have to arrest you, you see, they'll take you to Fort Smith. 
and you'll be away from your family and everything. And he got lots of it. Well, he's done just that way. His son grew up here. But he married one of the native women here. And somehow or another, they got into trouble, and he killed her. He murdered her. Leo Bennett was the head marshal here. And he was arming his men. He got word that the boy had uh, determined not to be arrested alive. Threatened them not to come to his house because he wasn't going to be arrested. Baz got a hold of it. Baz went to the office, Leo Bennett's office, and asked them not to go up there. Some of you will get killed. Let me have the warrant. And I'll go up there. It's a bench warrant. And I'll do just what you, the warrant says. I'm going to bring him in, dead or alive. That's right. Well, the people who knew that, they called the people, they tell me a number of them followed him to the house where this young man was, begging him and insisting on that he not do it for fear he might get killed. But he went on, Baz did, got to the house, and he yelled to this boy, his name was Benny. And now Benny said, you know more my son. In fact, you, you committed a crime, and I have a warrant in my pocket for you, a bench warrant. It's either to bring you in dead or alive, and I'm going to take you in today one way or the other. No, just that's all he stood. You can come on out with your hands up, or else your whole body will be down. Benny came out, the people standing around, hollered to him, said, don't raise your hands or he'd kill you, show. Basil suddenly gets it, and he meant to do it. <laughs> and he arrested Benny and took him in. Benny went to penitentiary. by the only mail route between Muskogee and Okmulgee. That was the through road going west. People came that way going to Homestead. And I was quite a small boy there, but I remember well. They're passing there and they would stop at our place to get water. Some of them camp overnight. There's a grove of trees there and they camp there and got wood to burn and some of them would stay there two, three days resting or recruiting. And I'd hear my mother talking with the women folk. And they said they were on their way to the promised land. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> they were going to homestead the original Oklahoma. In 1892, when I first came here, well, there was two frame buildings here and the rest was tents and dugouts. Now those that had horses and cattle and stuff like that, why they, they made it. But then now you take a person to come in here with nothing, just to his bare hands, well then he had to dig this out. Happy? Yes, sir, I was the happiest seller you ever saw. I thought Oklahoma was the goodest of the place I ever saw in the spring. All kind of flowers come up. It was like that, you know. Yeah, I like Oklahoma, yeah. The Reverend Paul Sykes was one of those who led people to the Promised Land. He landed with 600 ex-slaves in Kingfisher, Oklahoma Territory. The year before, lands to the west were opened. To feed his people, 
He preached at the Rock Island Station. He did that for years. The old gentleman would come down here and meet the trains. There were probably in those days be three or four trains a day. He had his cane and he was stooped a little bit. And he would start to sing. The old ox are moving, the moving, the moving. The old ox are moving, the moving right along. You're going up to heaven like a feather in the air. The old ox are moving, the moving, the moving. The old ox are moving, the moving right along. And that was it. And that was part of his preaching, in a way of speaking. After the train had stopped, people then, of course, would throw a little money out to him. Sometimes maybe they'd throw a dollar, 50 cents, sometimes a silver dollar in those days, but mostly it was probably nickels and dimes. And I'd say he would feed two or three hundred people about three times a month, and all this food would derive from salesmen that was coming through here, and they would give him sometimes hogs, turkeys, the Indians and whites and blacks and all of them come to this feast. He's a preacher, but he lived it. Now the scene shifts. The boys all left here and enlisted in the old Oklahoma National Guard. We finally got overseas. We ran into the lines. We lost a lot of good boys. I got knocked out for the bad. Now I'm on the platform in Paris, France, and I'm waiting for the train to go to La Havre, to cross the channel, to go home on a visit. The Frenchman asked me what part of Oklahoma was I from, and I said Kingfisher. And he studied a second, and his brows knitted. Ah, he says, the black man. He dance, he sing. <laughs> I looked at him in amazement, you know. And I said, yes. The old ox are moving, the moving, the moving. Old ox are moving, the moving right along. I go up to heaven like a feather in the air. The old ox are moving, the moving, the moving. Old ox are moving, the moving right along. Now he had lots more verses to that, but I don't recall them. He had other songs he sang too, but I don't remember any of those. But I do remember that real well. When gay birds trump, here you shall hear, and we love shout. Together in that morning. The public pressure to open up new lands did not stop with the western runs. There were those who felt the civilized tribes held more land than they needed, and that eastern Oklahoma ought to be open to white settlement. Up to this point, the land in Indian Territory belonged to the tribes as a whole. There was no individual ownership. But the government set up the Dawes Commission in the late 1800s, in hopes that after land was assigned individually, white settlers could find room. They did. And all they ain't shall bid them come, and we'll all shout together in that morning. In order to allot the land, the Dawes Commission was instructed to prepare a list of members of each tribe. This list included black freedmen. Not all of the blacks were to get an even shake. But Creek freedmen got more than anybody else due to the twinkling eye of Judge Reed. Judge Reed was, a, was an honorable man, but he, he was a black man and he was for his people, but he was an interpreter. He was educated. He interpreted for all of the chiefs. And so when they got to the allotment of the land, and the chiefs, they were sitting with the Dawes Commission, said, well, now, how much of this land? Now, we've got it there. We can give 160 acres. The chief said, 
The Indians all get 160 acres. At least that's what George Reed interpreted them. Indians all get 160 acres. Then they have, so we'll ask him, what are you going to do about these black people, these freedmen, these slaves? What, 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 what do they get? Say, don't they get something? And the chief said, nothing. Give them nothing. And uh, then the Dawes Commission, they asked George Reed, said, now, uh, what did he say? He said, same thing. They depended on him interpretation. <laughs> I remember back when uh, this was all uh, black and Indian in this section of the country. So I remember the first white man I ever saw. His name was Ed Hart. He gave me a dime and gave George Drew a nickel. Well, I looked at the size of money, and I said, now, here, yeah, I'm getting the short end of this thing. <laughs> so I just traded with George, you know. Trade my dime for his nickel. <laughs> I didn't know any better until we sent uh, send for some candy. <laughs> well, see, I didn't get but five or uh, uh, six stick, and George got ten. They were a penny a piece, you see. <laughs> and so that's the first time I got stuff. First deal I made, I got stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first white man you First ever white man, yeah, the no. name was Ed Hart. The foreman for Severs Ranch. foreman on Severs Ranch. That's right, I know. Absolutely. Oklahoma was one of the few places where blacks actually own land. And from the beginning, this fact was not lost to blacks or whites. It was a seat of power, but a bone of contention. For years, a move had been underfoot to make Oklahoma an all-black state. In 1890, it was spurred on by Edwin McCabe a black man who sought appointment as territorial governor. McCabe had been state auditor of Kansas, but when his party refused to let him run for a second term, he came to Oklahoma, convinced that power lay only in numbers. For 10 years, McCabe's paper, the Langston Herald, was distributed throughout the South urging settlement in Oklahoma's all-black towns. There's between 15 and 20 Negro towns in a 50-mile radius of, of Muskogee. Now, when, when you stop to say, well, who are some of them? I could start with Taft, and then I could go down to Rentisville, could come up here to Summit, could go over here, down here to Wybark, and I'm talking about these post offices. Go from Wybark over to Tallahassee. There was a little town, Redbird and Clarksdale. All of those were absolute Negro towns. But now, why did these towns come into existence? Well, one thing about it is uh, uh, people like to get where they could have something of their own. One thing about it is they had a Negro mayor, had a Negro city council, and uh, everything, all the officers, they come here to Muskogee, they couldn't hold one of those officers. They couldn't even get to be a uh, dog catcher. Well, I mean, that's something fabulous. These other folks, they'd, they'd hear about that, and the folks would leave here and go down there uh, and sell them lots. And some of them would come up to see you. Yeah, they'd come up to see you. There was a Negro postmaster. They'd take him on down there and introduce him. Yeah. Uh, there was a Negro mayor. Yeah. He was there, there, and... Call a meeting. There's a Negro councilman, yeah. There's a Negro uh, marshal, town marshal, yeah. And uh, they were frightened and afraid, and they were being mishandled by the Ku Klux Klan and all other kind of other things. So it was really the first cry of freedom. But black homesteaders were greatly outnumbered. 
McCabe finally did manage to become deputy territorial auditor. But the only elected territorial black official lasted one term. G.I. Curran, a representative from Kingfisher, authored the territory's first civil rights bill. It did not pass. The seed of power had been planted in sand. did pass the legislature, and they were to affect the course of Oklahoma education to this day. The first allowed settlers to decide every three years whether they wanted to put black children in separate schools, a practice that had not been widespread before statehood. The second took that option away, and the third law forbid teachers from teaching children of the opposite race. Of course, many districts did not have enough black students to justify the cost of a separate school. So arrangements were made to bus black students to adjoining districts. They called it buckboarding. It's interesting to get the history of how Langston University came about. My father and uh, two other men neighbors there, an old man Bradley. They took Mamie Bradley and put her in a spring wagon. I don't know whether you all know what a spring wagon is or not. You call them pickups now with an automobile. They demanded to enroll this girl in the school at Edmond. Well, oh Lord, you see, they had come in uh, prior to statehood and all, but now Oklahoma came in segregated. Well, when they went around and took uh, Mamie Bradley over there and demanded that uh, they did that, that was when uh, the legislature got together and decided that we, they said, we got, we got set up a school for these black folks. We got set up a school for the Negroes. Of course, they called them all Negroes. Right? And uh, then there was this little prosperous community of educated people named after Langston, the named after uh, Negro Congress. That's where the name Langston came, uh, came back. So they decided, and here's what the legislature did. I think the legislature put up $5,000. Uh, if the town of Langston, if the people out there would give 40 acres, and they gave barbecues, pie suppers, well, where the Langston sits there now is that original 40 acres. But still, segregation was not widespread before statehood. People needed each other. Pigment made no difference in the dust at baling time. The farmers helped each other, and uh, you prepared dinner. They all ate together, and in fact, uh, you really didn't know your color unless you went to a mirror, see. And now perhaps I did live in a, an exceptional community, but I came from the time when people were hauling wheat to town on wagons, and if you were going to see a neighbor, you could go down to your box and wait until the wagon came by and ride on with that farm. And then in the evening, when the wagon would come, you hear it squeaking coming back, you could go down and catch a ride coming home. That would be for the black child and the white child. And uh, we played together. Ron would go over there and stay all night with his white girl, come over and stay all night with us. We didn't think no more about it. And then visit back and forth as though we were all one nationality. And we never did have a crossword. As the other wasn't busy and nothing was fixing the fence, he'd come over and help him. And when his fence needed fixing, dad would go over there and help him. And they were more lovable, that's one thing. They were so, they're so narrow now. And uh, they're so afraid you have more than they got. And I told them one thing I want is heaven when I die and live comfortable while I'm here.
the fall of 1906, my uh, husband and I would go down to the courthouse and go in the judge's chamber and listen to political speeches. C.N. Haskell was running for the Democratic nomination for governor. Any time he was there, his name was mentioned, he, he would have quite a crowd. They were in the courtroom, but I was in the chamber. And uh, in one of his campaign speeches, he made the, made the assertion that they were not to uh, mention anything about the Negro or Jim Crow or anything until after the Constitution was signed by the president who was then Theodore Roosevelt. Because if they did, Theodore Roosevelt would certainly not sign it and they couldn't become a state. They would wait until after the first uh, assembly of the, of the legislature to pass any kind of law, then they could do as they pleased about it. And all oh, that pleased them. And <laughs> they gave in to their feeding by throwing up their hats and just uh, hollering and hooping. And, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't mention anything about it at all. It was only after the first to House and Senate, they did the dirty work, so to speak, because they passed the Jim Crow law and passed separate uh, coaches for Negroes and whites. And they just, they were just absolutely, it made you feel that you just weren't human, that's all. After the Constitutional Convention, segregation became a highly charged political issue. Black citizens were, for the most part, Republicans. And Democrats, wanting to ensure a majority, did everything possible to see that blacks did not get their rights. You couldn't vote unless your grandfather voted in 1866, I believe. And 66, of course, that prohibited all Negroes from voting because no Negroes, their grandparents didn't vote in 66. Dan Porter was an old Civil War veteran. At that time, they were enforcing the Jim Crow law. Man said to him, she said, Don't you go in there and try to vote. He said, you can't read. He says, that do not make no difference. He says, I'm one of the men that made General Lee surrender. <laughs> you know who General Lee was, did you? He was general in the Civil War. Yeah, well, he was an old soldier. Well, they, they, he voted. A black man did get elected to the first house. A.C. Hamlin scooted to office after a staggering campaign expenditure of $5.45. He told the Secretary of State it would have been less. But a lot of his constituents enjoyed parties. There was nowhere to turn. 
segregation had received the blessing of the U.S. Supreme Court and in all things social. Blacks were to be as separate as the fingers on the hand. The court called it separate but equal. But nobody really believed that. The Senate met. The first Senate bill, of course, was uh, our separate coaches. There shall be separate coaches for Negroes and whites. And the separate coaches, the Negroes will put in just a little place right in front of the the train and the right next to the baggage car. And uh, it it was not very comfortable. wasn't kept clean. And it it was just very undesirable. And it it stayed that way as long as they had separate coaches. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why. And I rode on the train a many a time. A man by the name of Richard Taylor and I would go backward and forward from here to Dover. We'd walk in and sit down in the coach in the Jim Crow. Taylor would sit down with me. So when the conductor come through taking tickets, he said uh, to Taylor, says, what are you doing in here? Well, he said, um, Taylor says, I'm sitting down. Well, he said, don't you know you in the wrong coach? He says, well, I don't know whether I am or not. <laughs> so uh, he says, now you get up and go in the next coach. Well, the next apartment, because they only had a, it was a smoking part that was for the colored. And uh, on the other side was where the white smoked it. So Taylor says, well, maybe I don't belong in there. He says, well, where are you? Well, he says, I'm a man like anybody else. <laughs> Men shall I be delivered from this framework of sin, shall yell the trumpet sound in that morning. Shadow glory for I shall mount above the skies, yeah, the trumpet sound in that morning. Well, that's it. Yes, sir, that's it. My eyes about gone now. <laughs> yeah, they're old. They're too old. They're about gone on me. <laughs>